Hi, yes, hello everyone. I'm Gavin.js and today I want to do something a little bit different and walk through how I made this animation and talk some more about voids. I've talked briefly about voids before on this channel and I really like using them to bring a lot of life into my work. So that's what I'd like to do today. And in order to get started, I'd like to show you how I made this moth and how to animate it in a way that is very void friendly because not all animation techniques work well with voids. And if you happen to know other ways of animating things that work really well with voids, please let me know in the comments. I love to learn and if there's something out there that you know that you think would be really fun to share, by all means, please do. But without further ado, let's make this moth. So for the initial concept, I started off in Photoshop with a nice picture of a moth that I found online, and I just adjusted the colors slightly and then created an emission map and an alpha map, along with the emission strength map. All four of those are what we're going to end up using to make this really cool material. But this time around, I decided to ask Midjourney to create a moth for me, just because I wanted to use something that didn't already exist out there in nature, and it gave me a jumping off point that means that not everything has to be perfectly photorealistic to still really look good in this animation. So I went about editing the image here in just about the same way. I did use Illustrator in combination with Photoshop, and using Image Trace I was able to get something that looked really neat, but at the end I still got the same three images that we need to create this overall effect. We have the base color, we have the emission strength, and we have the alpha. Okay, so jumping into Blender here, we're gonna go ahead and select everything and just delete our default sphere. And then we're going to make a plane. And we're gonna just go ahead and switch over to the shader editor. And with our plane selected, we're gonna create a new material. Our principal BSDF is perfectly fine. And let's bring in our texture maps. I have my albedo or base color. I have my emission strength and I have my alpha. We can just plug it albedo into the base color. We can also plug that into the emission and then we'll take the emission strength into the emission strength and the alpha. That all sounds very straightforward obviously, but uh, it's important that we use the same texture for the base color and the emission because I really just wanna take those colors. I don't really wanna change what color the emission is going to be doing. But now the emission strength, I'm going to go ahead and add a vector math node. Let's change that to scale. And then I'm going to crank this up to 10. I found that one is just fine if you wanna leave the emission strength as is. It's totally up to you as to how much you want to crank it. I thought that 10 looked good, but whatever feels right. Just reorganize our nodes here, and that is basically our moth wing material done. None of the other settings really matter. You can leave them just as they are. If you want to get fancy with it, you can definitely adjust them. The only one I'm really going to adjust is bringing the roughness all the way up because I don't want any reflection of any sorts going on on our moth wings that just doesn't feel right. I think having them completely rough sounds good. We don't really need to overthink any of these other settings and now we can move on to making the antenna. And the antenna is literally the same exact process. We're just going to use two different materials. So I'll just time lapse through that real quick. Okay, with those two materials made, let's switch over to material preview. Let's also make sure that we change our render engine from EV to Cycles. But okay, with that brought into Blender, let's go ahead and jump into edit mode and make sure that all of your vertices are selected. We're just going to move everything over so that the pivot point of your wing, where it looks like the wings would pivot, is close to the anchor point of the object. So I'm just going to rotate it a little bit, grab that and move it up, and I think that looks pretty good. Now what we can do is go over to our modifiers and add a mirror modifier. This will make it so that we get both of those wings in there and it looks really good. Later on we'll apply that modifier, but right now it'll just make it so that we can visualize everything really well. So now let's just bring in a second plane and add the antenna material. And now we'll just go ahead and jump into edit mode one more time, grab all of those and just go ahead and do basically the same thing. One thing we're going to do here, though, is just rotate this on the Y axis and make sure that your pivot point is going to be the 3D cursor, so long as it's still there at the origin. Partially just so that it sits up, I think that looks better because it shouldn't be just perfectly flat. I think giving it a little bit more height will look good in the end. Okay, and with that said, let's go ahead and make one more piece of geometry. This time we're going to make a cube and hop into edit mode 
this is going to be our body. So let's uh, hit S to scale and then shift Y so that we're scaling on the X and the Z. And that looks pretty good. Now let's scale on the Y and bring that down. We're going to want a tube basically so that when we subdivide it, we'll have something that kind of looks like a worm. There we go. And just real quick before we do anything else, let's add a couple of subdivisions here just because I want a little bit of variation. That looks good. Let's add a subdivision surface modifier. Feel free to add as much detail as you want there. I think this basic shape will look just fine. And we're going to want to apply all of the modifiers. In fact, now that I'm looking at it, I forgot to add the mirror modifier for the antenna. There we go. Let's just grab everything and bring it down on the Z so that the wings aren't perfectly in the middle of the body. And then next thing we can do is move on to making the material for the body. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start off with a wave texture. And if we just plug that into our base color, we can see that we get these bands. But we actually want to change this from X to Y. That way we get it along the length of the body there. And we're also going to change that from sign to saw. That way we get that hard cutoff where it changes from white to black. That'll just mean that when we go ahead and add our color ramp here, it'll read the color ramp from black to white and then start right back over. Whereas if we had sign, it'll go from black to white and then back to black. I'd rather have that hard cut off so that the pattern can just repeat once it's finished instead of then doubling back on itself. So actually we're going to go ahead and flip the color ramp set that back to saw and now we can start adding some colors here i pulled out some of the colors from the wing that way we can add them in and have the bands mimic the same colors as the wings I'm pretty happy with that color. Uh, I might adjust it a little bit more later on, but overall this is sort of what we're going for. That way we have a large bit of this main color and then a couple of smaller bands with those secondary colors in there. And then I just added in that first color again at the end. That way it doesn't have a hard line where it repeats and it can kind of blend right back into that initial pattern. So with all of that set up, what we're going to do now is just bring in another wave texture. And if we plug this into our base color just so we can see it real quick, let's bring the scale down so that we really only have one iteration of this. And actually, let's negate that scale so that we have it again dark in front and white at the back. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this for the emission. I want it to have these colors for the emission, but I want the strength to increase as you go along the body. The head shouldn't really have too much emission and we're not going to have much more detail for the head. But if we make it so that it doesn't emit light, then it'll draw less attention than the back where these bands would make a lot more sense for it to have. So we'll add in another color ramp here so that we can pull those values in and change this to B-spline so that we have a much smoother fall off on the gradient here. In addition to that, we're actually going to duplicate this color ramp and feed this wave texture in there. Uh, and we're going to change all of these to grayscale values. So just take your saturation and completely get rid of it. And we're going to adjust these locations just a little bit so that there's a little bit more variation and actually use beast blind here because I want a little bit more fall off for all of this. And we're going to use this in combination with this color ramp to drive the emission strength for this texture. OK, let's bring in a mix node and just feed that into base color so that we can see what's going on. And we're going to set this to multiply. That way we get a lot of the dark color here at the at the front and it gets lighter towards the back. Let's actually adjust that just a little bit so that we get more of that color. I want it to really glow at the end and not towards the front, but I don't want a hard line. Okay, that'll do pretty well for our emission strength. Let's just add another vector scale so we can control the overall emission. And that's going to look a little bit weird in the base color, so let's Go ahead and now pull that down to emission strength where it's supposed to be. Feed our color into the color 
and also into our emission. And yeah, I'm happy with that. So now if we look at the viewport render, it's starting to look pretty good. Overall, I think I'm pretty happy with these textures. It doesn't look the most realistic, but it has a very nice stylized feel to it. And I really like how it looks. So now that we have everything made and all the materials are there, what we're going to do is prep this for animation. At the moment, we have three different pieces. We've got two planes and a cube, and we need this to be a single piece of geometry. That's one of the limitations of voids. They'll only use one object per void instance. So we have to make sure that all of this geometry is condensed down into a single object. That means we can't have any modifiers, so we need to go ahead and apply our mirror modifiers. I guess that doesn't mean you can't have modifiers, it's more we don't want to have a mirror modifier on the cube. So we're going to apply all of the modifiers so that we just don't have any to worry about. Now we can just select everything and hit Control J to join all of our geometry, and we can go ahead and label that Moth. One thing you'll notice is that that does mess up the body material, so we'll just have to go back into our materials and play with the scale of this wave texture. Get our rings back, and then it looks like we'll also have to play with this texture. And there we go. Just had to play with the scale and the offset slightly so that we got the overall look that we had back. And now that that's fixed, we can go ahead and play with our animation. So we'll be working in the object data properties and playing with shape keys. This will allow us to animate the moth and also be able to go back later and edit the animation if we need to. Whereas if we animated it with armatures or other control geometry, we'd have to then bake that animation to the vertices and we wouldn't be able to edit it any further. This we can at least edit after we've applied it to our voids in case there are any tweaks we need to make. So let's jump into edit mode. Something we'll want to do to just make this whole process a lot easier is we're going to want to select all of the vertices on one side and create a new vertex group. I'm just going to call this right and then do the same for the left. When creating these vertex groups, make sure once you've hit the plus and created one, hit assign while you have all of your vertices selected. Otherwise, you won't actually put them into the group. You'll just have made a group. I do that all the time. In fact, I did that with the right side here. So I'm just going to select those all again, select the right and assign. There we go. So if we hit right and select, now we can just quickly select all of those vertices without too much hassle. And the same with the left. Helps if I had the right deselected to show that off, but yeah, there we go. Now, in order to use our shape keys, we're gonna have to jump out of edit mode, back to object mode, and then hit the plus here under shape keys, and that'll give us our basis. What shape keys do is just lets you interpolate between different positions from that position to the basis. But with basis selected, since that's the position we're going to be starting from, we're going to want to set the position of all of our vertices for that starting point. So let's jump back into edit mode, select our right side, make sure we're pivoting off of the 3D cursor that's still at the world origin, and hit rotate. And we're just going to rotate this to one extreme that I want the wings to be. Once we finalize that rotation, we're going to just edit it to something a little bit more round on the angle and easier to remember so that then we can deselect our vertices and select the opposite group and rotate it to whatever and set it to the opposite sign of the first set. So that's half the animation done. Now we just need to jump back into object mode hit the plus on our shape keys and create key one. Jump back into edit mode and repeat the process. Okay, and we jump back out into object mode and we can see that uh, even though we just set those positions, it jumps back to the first position because with key one selected, our value is currently set to zero. This is the value that interpolates between basis and your keys. And so if we adjust this, we can see that they start to animate. Now, we do have something kind of weird happening here. What we have going on is it's just going from one position to the other. Hopefully you can see that instead of really rotating like you would expect it to, it's just kind of transitioning linearly from one to the other. And that's fine. 
but it's definitely not what I had expected. In fact, I kind of just left it like this for the initial animation that I made, but I think we could do a lot better. There's honestly nothing wrong with this sort of animation, especially once you get it going fast enough. That'll really be all you need, but just be aware, it's really just kind of stretching and warping and distorting instead of smoothly rotating. So keep that in mind. I think this is perfectly fine for the base thing, but you could set up another set of keyframes and use sine and cosine to get a real curve going on. But for now, I'm just going to leave it like this because Honestly, when we animate it at the speed that we're going to, nobody will be able to tell the difference. And speaking of animation, we're going to add a driver so that it'll animate periodically. And by periodically, I literally mean periodically. We're going to do some math. So go ahead and right click, add a driver, get rid of this variable. We don't need any variables there. And so for our formula, we're going to use cosine of the frame divided by 2, divided by 2, plus 0.5, or 1 half. So, why are we doing that? What is this witchcraft? Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're taking a cosine function, which starts from a value of 1 and transitions to a value of negative 1. Basically, when we are, we're on frame 0, or 1 really, we're going to start all the way in our key 1 position. Then as time progresses, we're going to transition to a value of negative 1. But unfortunately, we can only interpolate between values of 0 and 1 with key shapes. So to correct for that, we're going to divide everything by half so that we fit our values between negative half, positive half, and then we're going to increase it by half to fit it between 0 and 1. That was a long roundabout way of explaining what this function does. It's really very simple, I promise. It'll do the math that you want. But now, when we hit play, we have our moth animating between the two key positions very smoothly, very quickly, and I think that that works really well. Of course, unless you pause it right in the middle where the distortion is greatest. And now our moth is completely ready to go and be added to our Boyd simulation. But that's going to be all for today. Next time we'll start our Boyd simulation and we'll go over all of the different parameters we can use to make a really cool and effective swarm animation. So thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!